All right. Hello, Scott. Thank you for joining me on the Flipping Junkie podcast. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I noticed, you know, they sent over your bio and you have an architecture background and, um, you know, have been published and, and done a lot of things. But when we got to talking before the show, you had talked about the fact that you, you started with multifamily, moved into uh, single family and then to commercial and then doing self storage and, and just, you know, talking, discussing about how this, the show would go, what we would talk about and discuss is you had mentioned the fact that the principles kind of, you know, there's, there's some principles that fit along no matter which type of investing you're doing. And so I'd like to elaborate on that through this episode, but let's start first with your story, with your background. How did you get interested in real estate and take as much time as you like to, to explain this. Some people say, well, I read a book, I, I started doing it. I prefer the, the, the more of the filled in details, more of the, what got you excited? What was that thing? And how did you find a mentor or how did you get training? What did you do? All that kind of stuff. So just share as much as you'd like. Okay, absolutely. The, um, the real, it wasn't one book that did it for me. Um, I, I enjoyed, you know, designing things in, you know, and building things well before um, I got into real estate. So I was doing that as a kid. Um, and also in high school, I took architectural classes and, and, you know, drawings and those sorts of things. So, but I wasn't, I wasn't convinced that I was going to go all in in, ar in architecture as an undergraduate. And I was, you know, like, what happens if I go to a tech school and I don't like it and, and I'm stuck at this boring tech school. <laughs> and so I went to a liberal arts school where I was able to play uh, college soccer and college football. And then, um, you know, my senior year, I thought I was going to be going into the family business, which was die castings and building more things and involved engineering and art, you know, design, those sorts of things. And my parents showed up on campus and they said, nope, you're going to not be going into the family business. And, you know, I thought I had done something wrong. I, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, so like, you know, you drove all the way out to, you know, Ohio from Chicago to tell me that I was not going to be part of the family business. And um, they said they were selling the company. So <laughs> My dad encouraged me to go back into architecture and it was because of him that I began exploring that they, they had just created this new master's program for people that had an undergraduate and non-architectural degrees that could get their master's in architecture. And so that's how I, I got back into it. You know, it was, it was a way to um, pursue it and learn about it and, and continue it and develop that skill that I had put off for four years. And I was fortunate enough that when I was there, I was a TA in my my first professor um, owned a real estate development and architectural design build firm. And so I got to see firsthand, and he was my first mentor, really learning the ins and out of the real estate development business. He was the only professor in the school that was a developer as well. And, you know, he got a lot of flack for it too, because, you know, he, he was on the dark side because he, you know, he was a, made money. And you know, I'm like, why is that a bad thing? You know, so everybody else was like these, starving artist type people and I'm like okay that's not what I really want to be and I realized that quickly that the developers were the ones that made the money so that's how I got into it I was fortunate enough to work for him and and uh, work for him for six years as well as while in school and so I got to understand the, the, the full ins and outs of the real estate development company. Nice uh, so what what were you guys developing I mean what specifically were you working on what were the projects some of those first projects that you were working on? When I started, he had just he was just finishing up a 175 unit development, uh, mostly town, mostly condominiums and some townhomes. So my master's thesis, he said uh, to the class, "We're going to start working on this development that I want to do." It was on 50 acres. It started off as a thousand condominiums, and wow. through the zoning, it got whittled down to uh, just over 300 condominiums, 64 townhomes, and 16 single family homes. And so that was my master's thesis, and I you know, I came up with a concept and a plan for it and he chose mine and we began developing that throughout the course of the year and then we took it through the zoning process. So I was running that and so I, since I was the only one who had an undergraduate degree that I meant I could read and write as opposed to just draw, he had me, you know, working on loan docs, he had it working on condominium docs and I was putting together the financial performer for the entire development. And so everybody else, in the office was drafting and I was the one doing the, the financial side of things. So while that project was going, then I began also working on a 40 unit uh, condominium development. And so 
my background was really in the commercial multifamily side. We were doing that in, in mixed use. Um, we had some projects that were apartments and, condo, and uh, commercial, and we were converting them to condominium. And so you know, we worked on three of those projects in, in a single family house firm. Where, where were all these projects? Were they mostly located in Chicago? All on the north side of uh, the Chicago suburbs. So they were you know, basically just outside the city of Chicago on the north side. Uh, yeah, I love Chicago. I love uh, visiting up there and when it's not super cold. Well, we're still waiting for that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in the 90s, I think, down here in, in Texas. But um, all right, so great. Then how, how, what, how did the transition into um, single family, how did that happen? In 1998, I started my own firm and, you know, I was, I was 28 years old. So for me to do wow. you know, a 40 unit condominium development was, was a big step. And so we began with single family. I raised um, hundred thousand dollars. I went to three investors and we raised a hundred grand and we, we bought a property for $300,000. We tore it down, built a new house and uh, sold it for a million fifty. And that's how I began working in, uh, you know, it, no one called it house flipping back then, but uh, you know this was in the late night, uh, late late nineties and early mm. two thousands. We they didn't have um, you know flip this channel and yeah. you know everybody on TV flipping houses and stuff like that. But uh, you know that that market here in the in the North Shore of the Chicagoland market, we were just tearing down homes and uh, and building them. And you know there were some the nice margins that we were able to accomplish there. Yeah, so was that mostly what you guys did? Were taking some of the smaller, older homes, and uh, and and tearing those down to to make a bigger, you know, in these neighborhoods maybe where there were larger homes mixed in with smaller homes, it was that typically your model? We had two sides. So we on the investment side, we were taking older homes and tearing them down, um, and then we also had clients that hired us to fix fix up their homes and, and add, put additions on them and those sorts of things. I mean. The property here is such a premium that it was to just fix up an existing home and not add on expand it or do something along those lines. Just there wasn't really a market for it. Everything had to be changed in the program of the house. So that meant either tearing it down or putting on a second story or an addition or you know redoing it, but you know, expanding the footprint. So everything that we were doing was expanding the footprint. We didn't take any home and just cosmetically fix it up. That that market did not exist. Right. Yeah. So any advice for, for real estate investors that aren't architects to be able to get into that? Because I think a lot of investors, you know, they shy away from that. It seems like too much work or it's, you know, it, it seems like a whole nother ball game of, of taking something like that and tearing it down and building a brand new home. Um, you know, any advice maybe for, for people out there that aren't, you know, trained as architects to be able to do that. I mean, what, what, uh, what should you look for in an architect to help you with something like that as an investment? Well, when I did uh, real estate coaching and consulting, I always told everybody that you really need to develop a strong team. You know, you, not, even though I have this degree and I, you know, I've been doing it for now 25 years, that doesn't mean I can do it by myself. I still have to have a team. And the longer I get into this, the, the more I re rely upon my team. So, you know, that begins with, you know, if you're just starting off, you really got to have a good broker. You got to have, um, you know, a good contractor that's in your pocket that you can work with. And when I say in your pocket, meaning that you can rely upon um, a, a lender, you know, your equity investors, any of those people are all part of your team. And you really have to focus on developing each aspect of that team. So, you know, when we, you know, when we're, we're now doing out-of-state investments, so we have to hire local architects who, can, who are licensed in those local states. So we're going through the same process. We're, we're having to interview people and, and you know, seeing what their qualifications are and, and hiring people locally in order to facilitate our projects that we're doing across the country. So it doesn't matter if you're just starting off or you've been doing it for 25 years, the concepts remain the same. And for us, you know, the first thing that we do when we're looking at an architect is we look at their website. You know, we, we evaluate what type of things that they've done and, you know, what is the caliber of their home. And, you know, there's, there's plenty of sites out there now. We, we have our own website, but then there's places like house.com where, you know, you can find any sort of architect. You can find any sort of design builder out there. 
And if they don't have things out there to show the examples of her work or references, then, then that says a lot about it. Um, so, you know, we, we interview and we, we focus on those types of people that we can assess, is that work similar to what we're trying to do or is it well beyond or totally different? Um, you know, the projects that we're doing now, if they, if they haven't done anything commercial, then we typically don't hire them because they're not as familiar with it. If, if we were just doing single family, then, then I'm not going to be looking at a guy who's, you know, doing skyscrapers, you know, we're right. looking for someone who's got a, a much smaller scale. Um, so, you know, that's the type of, you know, is it for a fix and flip type property, you're probably looking for an architect who's a sole proprietor, you know, someone who's, you know, the only one in the office that can devote a good amount of time to just your project, can knock it out. We like people that have worked with CAD. I mean, I grew up hand drafting, but we recognize that there's efficiencies working with CAD, and that's an important thing for us. So if someone is only doing hand drafting at this point in time, then I would probably look elsewhere. You know, in, you might think these are basic concepts, but it's still amazing how far, you know, people are still utilizing those older tools and getting by, I mean, we see it in our, when we're, when people present us drawings, we get all sorts of, you know, quality of drawings. And that would be the next thing is looking at their work, you know, at not asking for finished photos, but actually drawings and seeing how thorough they are, what type of quality they, they are, those sorts of things. Nice. So let, can we go back to the single family uh, properties once? How are you finding these properties? for the ones that you are doing for yourself at investment through your firm. Um, how are you finding those properties and, and, you know, doing the analysis to figure out, okay, this is a prime property that I'd like to purchase to go ahead and tear down and then deciding what kind of home you would build there. We had a wide range. I mean, in the net still is pretty wide for us. We don't just have one source, but obviously brokers are up there. Um, you know, also driving, we would drive neighborhoods, you know, and, and look for properties and, and do research in terms of who was the owner of them, if we thought they were run down or this or that, and, and make phone calls. Um, the other aspect of it is our attorneys, the title companies brought us properties. You know, they would have someone that had a, you know, a claim because, you know, their house caught on fire and it was burned down and we would buy a burned down property. We got quite a few through that. I mean, that, in each of these cases, what we're always looking to do is try to solve a problem. And, you know, obviously in 08 and 09, when the market crashed, there was a lot more problems that you know, needed to be solved. You know, in today's market in Chicago, I think it's very, it's a lot more difficult to find a good deal because the valuations are so high. And I think the market is at the apex. And so that's another thing that we, we apply throughout across the board, whether it was 20 years ago or now, we're really studying what the market forces are and where we are in the cycle and making sure that we're not getting caught at the wrong time. And part of that is just recognizing, you know, what is the premium for properties right now and is it a good time to be in it or is it a good time to be not buying and looking at other markets? And so if you don't have those resources of all those different people providing you with, um, you know, lead and sources, then you're probably going to get caught if you're only doing it on the MLS because you're going to be paying that premium right off the top. So, um, you know, the more resources that you have that you can tap into, um, the better off. I mean, I, I can't tell you what our one predominant source was because we had so many different sources of people bringing us properties. Yeah. It, so what, what did you, so you were, you know, when you would meet people and you would network and, and have these different sources, you know, come into your network. What was it kind of, were you talking about what you were looking for then, you know, saying we, we want to solve a problem. So if there's a situation like a burn house where they don't want to rebuild and it's a perfect opportunity because the house most likely going to be tore down anyway, and we can buy it cheap and, and, and build the house here. You know, what was the conversation like? What were you telling them you were looking for? We, we were telling them that we were able to handle any type of situation. So, um, and you know, a lot of people say that, but the fact that once we had developed a reputation of taking properties and, and being able to close on them that were, you know, difficult situations. And this is pre 2008, 2009, and even pre nine 11, where we had a, a mini recession at that point in time, um, they knew that we could get the job done. And so it got the word out there that, Hey, if you had a difficult situation, um, 
that we were we were buyers that if we said we we're going to close, we were going to close, and, and and that brought us a lot more deals because when the attorneys are saying, "Hey, look, I got this insurance claim, and they need to get out. Can you help them out?" and we were able to assess it very quickly, and so the markets that we were we were, we would focus on different communities, not neighborhoods, but communities. And if we if the homes fell in those communities, then we knew that there was gonna be uptick in value that we could do forced appreciation. So the underlying thing that everybody knew was that we were looking for forced appreciation in the property. And when I say forced appreciation, that means we were gonna change the program. We were gonna change the size, the, the number of bedrooms, the number of baths. We, anything that I do in real estate, we are forcing appreciation, whether it was single family, multifamily, or even the self storage that we're doing now, we are always looking to change what is there and improve upon it to have a much greater value. And so people knew that we could get those sorts of things done. We had the resources, we had the bank, we had the contractors, we had, you know, everybody in line ready to go because of our, you know, our background. Yeah. There's big money. Like you said, in the example, the first example you gave, uh, doing, you know, properties that way, were you, ever going beyond what the community already supported and, and seeing if you could get it or were you guys stay basically looking at okay these new homes are built in this style and people are buying them for this much so we're going to do the same thing and, and go off of similar properties that have sold in similar styles or were you you know designing something completely different just to be creative and see what would happen did you you know how, how did that work it was both i mean i think you have a little bit more liberty when it comes to um, multifamily and then you do single family um, and the single family to change what you can do on a property is very hard to do because you have to really show a hardship we have accomplished that but it was like very unique situations and and I would not go in making the recommendation and trying to go in and, and saying hey look I, you know I'm allowed to build a 2400 square foot home but you know this property really needs a 4800 square foot home <laughs> you know I mean that you're just going to get laughed out and you're just wasting everyone's time. Um, but the, the first one where you went in and changed the, the zoning on it was, um, it was just under an acre and it was a greenhouse and it was sitting, no one could do anything with it because it was zoned for a single family house. And this was an, an acre in a, in a community that had a whole bunch of smaller split levels. And so we saw as a prime opportunity to come in and change the zoning and build townhomes. And so we went to the village and, or the city and we presented our idea and they said, well, great, but based upon your experience, and we made it look colonial, we made it look traditional because we thought we'd have a higher probability of success. And the city said, we don't want that. We want to be contemporary. And based upon your background, you should be making this contemporary. And we said, we'd love to make it contemporary. We didn't think we'd get it approved. <laughs> like, That's interesting, like, yeah. Yeah, and they said, no, that's what we want. And so we came up with this concept. Instead of just doing row homes or a row of townhomes, we, we created these pods where they were overlapping and in, in, in different directions. So every space had its green space, and every townhome had a view from three sides as opposed to just one or two sides. Mm. And so it was like the first green project that was ever done in that community. It was This was in 2000 because we were creating a lot more open green space and reducing the amount of asphalt and pavement in, in this property because they all share like a common access point off the alley. And, you know, when you go to a public meeting, you don't want your neighbors to come. That, that's usually a bad indicator that, you know, they're not in support of you. If people don't mind what you're doing, they don't bother to come and tell you you're right. doing a good job. They only come to complain. So the, the first meeting we had, I mean, we held it at the, the local ice skating rink and they had a, they had a big conference meeting room there and the place is packed out. It just absolutely. Packed. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a good sign. You know? And so, you know, we open up the meeting I try to do my presentation and hands are just shooting up and, and shooting up. And I'm like, okay, I, I got to stop where I am and just try to get some of these questions out of the line. So I, I asked the first question, someone said, so are you gonna be doing low income housing? We heard you're doing low income housing here. In our neighborhood is not a low income housing neighborhood. And I said, no, we're, we're gonna be designing and building townhomes 
that are going to be for sale and they're going to you know be like around three hundred thousand dollars. They're like, okay, good. And then all the hands went down. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta find that person who planted the seed that we were putting in low income housing. And um, after that, we, uh, you know, they said, well, you know, there was another hand shot up and we said, okay, what's your question? They said, well, it's a little too contemporary. You know, can you address that? We said, well, the city wanted us to be contemporary. We have these traditional two story homes to the north of us, we have these single family single story split levels to the south of us. So we did this two story with a flat rope to blend in in terms of the height. And you know, we, we were looking at these materials, it's mostly brick and cedar that we're trying to complement what's going on in the neighborhood. And, and they said, well, okay, but you have these like metal trellises and they're yellow. Can you do something about the yellow? And I said, would you like white? <laughs> they go, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Done. People are so funny, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. But I mean, that, that's the thing we've learned about the most is that people don't like change. Yeah. And when you when you introduce change into an area, that's what makes it hard as a real estate developer. And you got to have a thick skin for that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I, I we tore down a barn. Okay, it was literally a barn that got converted into a garage that got converted into an apartment, and you know, and. <laughs> You know, we're tearing it down to make a house, yeah. okay? And this woman comes up to me, doesn't know who I am, and says, can you believe that that jerk is tearing down that beautiful <laughs> old home and this monstrosity? You know, and, you know, hadn't seen the plans, hadn't seen what we were doing. Well, and, you know, it was just chewing me out because I was there and yeah. you know, watched, watching this. So bar. how long did you wait before you told her there was you? I said, you know, I said, well, I'm the developer, and if you'd like to see the plans, what we're going to do here, but uh, just so you know, for the record, that's not a house, that's a barn, you know, and it, it was the original barn. She goes, all the more reason why you shouldn't tear it down. <laughs> well, then you buy it. <laughs> you know? So, you know, that's... It's, yeah, you're right. People funny about change. And, and, and just the, like the mind going off into all these things about what it's going to be, you know, without even knowing and just making the assumptions and people yeah. talking to other people and thinking that they heard something when they just assumed it. Exactly. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the interesting world of being a developer. So develop a thick skin, develop a great team and have confidence in what you're doing. So it's a, those are all important factors. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, you probably have had times. Have you had times where it was hard for you where you question whether you should change something dramatically because of pressure from other people? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it when I say other people, I mean, the market, the market is other people, right? And, um, you know, the market has dramatically changed in 25 years. So the first big change was in 08, 09, when we couldn't get a, a, a spec house loan. You know, I mean, our market went from, you know, we were building three and a half million dollar homes. We had 20 homes going at one point in time. And in 08, 09, the market dried up. We couldn't get one single family speculative new construction loan to do a house. And at the time we were having conversations and, you know, and people in our company were saying like, well, why don't we just keep doing what we're doing? And we're like, you don't understand. I can't get the financing. It's impossible for us to do what we've been doing. And, you know, we can't get anywhere near the terms that we're trying to accomplish. So we had to grow. We had to adjust. We had to change. And, you know, one of the things I like to say as a real estate investor is that, you know, we don't control the market. You know, we, we can monitor, we can respond, but we certainly don't control the market. When you begin to think that you do control the market, it's typically when people get burned. Yeah. So you, you need to really be a student of what the market is doing and keeping your eye open and, and very alert to it. And I'm part of a, a nationwide organization right now. It's 28,000 people across the country. Predominantly, I would say like 95% are doing um, house flips. And it's the same concept that I tell the people here. It's like, what is, what is going on in your market? And if you can't tell me right now exactly where the market cycle is, then you're, you're not a, an educated investor. And, that, and to me, that's a very scary thing. You need to be able to understand and communicate, you know, are you on the down cycle or are you on the up cycle? How many days on the market are you? What's the lead time? What's the average sales price compared to a year, two, three, five years ago? Right now in the Chicagoland area, 
we're seeing homes that we built in 08, 09 that we sold right before the crash that are trading at the same value as they were 10 years ago. Oh, wow. We had three and a half million dollar homes. And it's like that to me, that's, that's, that's an alarming statistic. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, that is a key indicator for me that, okay, what is the market doing and what do we have to do in response to that market? Yeah, because there always be signs before the big change happens, right? Or before something that right. causes a financial problem would happen. So you've moved into, you said you're doing the um, self-storage. You know, can you tell me about how you got into that and, and how exactly you're going about that? I was coaching and, you know, I had a client that wanted to buy a distressed self-storage and we couldn't find it, you know, and I always told him, I said, look, the big money in, in real estate is you can make good money taking a property and, and changing it a little bit or improving it a little bit, but you're going to be looking at it maybe like on a cash flow basis or, you know, a slight appreciation basis, but the real money is in development. You know, when you're, again, when you're changing the program, when you're changing the use of the property as a developer, that's when you make the big money. And I, and I kept telling them, I'm like, look, if you, you find a property that you feel you can improve it through the management, you might gain one point in terms of uh, the cap rate, which is how you evaluate commercial properties. And the lower the cap rate, the more valuable it is. But I said, if you do a development, you could, you could see like a five or six point um, increase in the cap rate, you know, and each point is worth, you know, potentially half a million dollars. So, you know, you're, you're much better off on the development side. And we found this property that we were going to use, um, for a different client. And the mayor said, you know, we went in the meeting and she did one of these, but she never said yes. Mm -hmm. And so, as we were leaving the, the city planners, like, wasn't it great? The mayor gave you your, her approval. I'm like, yeah, but she, she never really said yes. <laughs> and um, he goes, no, 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 she's on, she's on board. She's on board. Uh, about a month and a half later, after we began doing the drawings and, you know, we closed, we went hard on the contract. We hadn't closed yet, but we went hard on the contract. You know, our earnest money was hard. Um, we got a call from him saying, Hey, the mayor's changed her mind. <laughs> and um, You know, we're not going to be able to do what our client wanted to do. So now we're, we're, we're sitting on this piece of property. So I called up my client and said, Hey, look, you've been, you've been looking to get into self storage. I have this warehouse that could be converted into self storage. Um, you know, you come in and evaluate and if you think it's a good deal, great. If not, no harm, no foul. And they came in, he brought his team in. They, they determined that the, the demographics were good. It supported the need for self storage. The price is right. They could, you know, they can make all the numbers work. And he goes, well, we don't have anyone to build it for us or, or get us the zoning. <clears throat> so I said, well, we can do that. And so that's how I got into it. I, I learned by doing it in conjunction with somebody else. And then that person decided that there was too much risk for self storage. And so he went into mobile homes hmm. and we just kept doing it. And hmm. so, you know, that's, you know, I, saw what the concepts that we needed to do there. And to me, it was no different. I describe it as apartments without toilets. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, develop a thousand apartment buildings. Or it's always those pesky toilets too. So those toilets, those sinks and toilets, and it's a lot easier to deal with a tenant. <laughs> so um, to me, it's, it's a much more dumbed down version of an apartment. And so I don't have to worry about finishes. I don't have to worry about, you know, what color the carpet, you know, the countertops or any of those sorts of things. So, I sold all of our multifamily and we've been investing in self storage. Wow. So how many was that first, uh, the, the, um, conversion into the, the storage units? How many were that for the warehouse that you just mentioned? How many did you guys put in there? Uh, that was, uh, we began with 70,000 square feet and then they actually ended up buying 90,000 square feet. So when we sold it to them, it was just over 500 units and then they went and added more after the fact and they put some outdoor, um, wow. So that was in 2013 and, and we're now on our seventh project since that period of time. Nice. All in, in all over Chicago area? No, we're, we're now in uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Ohio. Oh, nice. Nice. So what do you go, how do you go about looking for the right uh, area for those? It's all demographic driven. You know, we, we look at a three mile radius and that's one of the, the beauties for us compared to single family homes is 
we have much better analytics and data that we can rely upon to determine a neighborhood. And we can look at, you know, how many other facilities are in the area. You know, the, the metric is the square footage of number of lockers per capita. And so that way we can, we can put a metrics to that and really determine, are we above the market saturation point where supply equals demand or are we below it? And so we will not go into markets where it's oversaturated, we, we, you know, or if we're close to saturation, we always want to be well below it. So the equivalent would be in a single family home is like, you know, knowing how many days, uh, you know, on the market properties are and where they are in comparison to lead times and, and, you know, understanding, you know, very specifically who the buyer is of your, your, your flip, you know, is it a, is it a couple, is it a single mom or is it, you know, is it a newly married or how many kids they have and what's their income level? You know, we literally know all those demographics when we go into it because we, we, we pay for them. We buy these reports that tell us exactly what the demographics are, what the median income is, how many percentage of renters, um, you know, it's, we're, we're applying a very specific analytic tool to what we're doing now compared to what we were doing when I first got into this. Do you mind sharing the resource where you get that information? We hire consultants. They're called feasibility consultants and we, we go and hire them. And, um, you know, we will not go hard on a contract until we have obtained that report and the, the, the findings of that report are, for, are favorable. And so um, that's what their, their calls so are called feasibility experts. Properties first and then doing a feasibility on a three mile radius. Is that right? Yeah, it has to be, it, we, we designate the exact property. I mean, we will say like, we found this building, this is the address, what, you know, can we do a report on this property? And so they will, it, typically the report's like 150 to 180 pages, and it will tell everything about the neighborhood and the community. Wow, that's pretty in depth, 150, 180 pages, yeah. Now, how often do you think that uh, you get those reports back and it doesn't support it? Um, well, that, that, that'd be a false metric for us because of the fact that before we buy it, you know, we might have a conversation with the consultant. Hey, what do you think about this neighborhood? And because we've, we've done enough business with them, they would say like, mm, you know, probably should take a pass on this one, you know, so when we buy it, we have a fairly good idea that it's going to be favorable to begin with. Oh, okay. And part of that is our, our knowledge as well that we're bringing to the table. So when we go in there, you know, we will look and say, okay, how many self storage facilities are in a three mile radius? And if there are like 20, then we don't even bother making an offer on the property. So we have a fairly good, so our rate of success when we buy the report is a hundred percent because we, we're going into it. No, we're just double checking it. We're double checking it, right? Are there any other kind of businesses or uh, things that to look for related to that in the area where you say, you know, if this exists here, this exists here, we also like that, and that points into the right direction? Yeah, I mean, a lot of good things are, you know, a lot of multifamily. Um, if you have um, a, a college or a university near you, a military base. Um, you know, we, we look for more of the urban settings that have older buildings that we can retrofit and convert. Um, the last building that we just bought, we bought for $11 a square foot. It's a five-story, 90,000 square foot building. I mean, I can't build the building for $11 yeah. a square foot. So we have a competitive advantage going into it right off the bat. And now we've applied all the tools that we've learned as fixed flipping houses and fixing and flipping them and applying them to self-storage. Because, you know, once we get to the build, the build's the easy part. You know, it's yeah. for us, it's, you know, all I have to do is put in new roof, new windows, new mechanicals, and then it's just like putting in lockers. You know, and a locker's a lot easier to put in than, you know, a $200,000 kitchen. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how uh, you know, how long do these projects typically take you, these storage products like this? Well, they, they are what we describe as a crock pot investment. Um, because of the fact that, you know, it, they take us about six, you know, nine months to fix them up, to convert them. And then they take a year uh, to lease them up to cover your expenses, then another year to cover your debt service. So they're in for three to five years. And that's the difference is that, but in the meantime, you're getting cash flow. And once we have these things stabilized, we're investing our investors 
equity out of the deal and so that their rate of return becomes a you know, you know, much higher rate of return because all their cash is back. And so that's ultimately our goal is to get our investors' cash back as quickly as possible. Nice. Yeah, this has been super informative. I really enjoyed and have enjoyed having you on the podcast. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience before we close out today? Uh, just, I really stress again, the importance of understanding your marketplace. I, I've seen so many people get hurt um, because of over eagerness or lack of knowledge. And I don't know which is worse, the eagerness or the, you know, the ignorance, if you will, in terms of not knowing the marketplace. Um, you know, I go to local areas to, to keep a pulse on what's going on in the marketplace. And I, I see investors trying to do deals on, you know, a 10% margin. Mm. But, you know, that's, that's one price correction and your profits wiped out. I mean, it's just way too much risk. So please do not underestimate the level of risk there and making sure that you're, you're being conservative. And my mentor, I've had a few mentors, but one of the ones that I, I, hold near and dear in my heart, he would always say, you know, look at best case scenario, worst case scenario, and what most likely will happen. Mm. And if you can live with what most likely will happen, great. It's a home run. You know, if you can get by with worst case scenario and still survive, okay, then that's, that's an acceptable amount of risk. But if worst case is going to wipe you out, mm. then, then why do it? Yeah. You know, it's not worth the risk. Right. And people can get caught up because they're thinking, best case scenario, I'm going to make $100,000 right. on this flip. And, and making it much easier to ignore the worst case, which, like you said, could put them in a position that's going to wipe them out and cause a domino effect with the rest of their investments or, you know, wipe out their reserves and, and cause more problems than they're anticipating. So, yeah, there, there's, yeah, I agree completely with you on, on making sure that you understand what's happening in the market to understand what that worst case really is, right? Because without that, you can guesstimate what the worst case might be. But if you're not really seeing the trend or seeing what's happening and anticipating that, that you could be into that property for nine months or more, and a lot of things can happen in that amount of time. The, I'll give you two examples. The, the last flip, we, we bought a property for $230,000. We, we built a new home on there for just over four hundred. dollars and we thought the market could support a million dollar house. And we dropped the price $200,000 to get out, you know, and because of the year that we came online, four homes sold in January, new homes, and then the rest of the year, not another single. Oh, wow. Construction sold the rest of the year. So we rented it out. That was our worst case scenario. We, we hmm. rented out. So we had a renter in there to cover our expenses. We weren't making any money, but we weren't, we weren't paying on the nut every month. And then we, um, we put it on the market with her still living there. And we had someone come in who wanted us to be creative. And, you know, and we, we were trying to work with them, but they wanted us to um, basically lease them the house for over a year. And then when they got the bonus, they would buy it. And we had no certainty on the bonus or any of the structures and they didn't want their money to go hard. And we felt like there's too much risk. Yeah. We told them like, we're not, you know, we'll work with you, but you have to give us something in order to mitigate our risk. The contract fell apart. We put it back on the market and sold it, but you know, we sold it for $250,000 less than what we thought we could. Mm. And so, you know, that, that is just one swing on one property. And then uh, another situation is where, you know, we saw a bunch of people just get wiped out because they had too many properties. They were based upon appreciation. And then when the market didn't appreciate, they, they, their whole model was based upon appreciation. So, you know, you need to be careful in those types of situations. Yeah, that should always be the icing on the cake, the appreciation, not, not the cake itself. Right, exactly. All right, Scott, no, I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure meeting you and talking with you and hope we can stay in touch. And if anybody out there listening would like to talk with you more, uh, is there any way that they can, can uh, reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if they do info, I-N-F-O at CODA, C-O-D-A-M-G as in managementgroup.com, that will get to me and we can go, we can begin the conversation from there. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, have a great day. You too.